Star Wars and female characters. Loading gun, aiming at own foot. I've been wanting to talk about this for some time now, but I've been avoiding it mostly because it seems to be a subject that stirs a lot of conflicting opinions online. It attracts discussions about misogyny and feminist agendas, and I really don't want to go that route. You see, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm female. Yeah, I know, I was shocked too when I found out this morning. And while having a uterus doesn't give me the full authority on this subject matter, I do want as a female to bring my honest opinion about this issue. Women have been underrepresented in film for decades, and like many, I want to see more female characters in Star Wars and other blockbusters. But after watching all the movies that have been released thus far, I really don't like the direction that the franchise has taken. Yes, we have more women than ever in Star Wars, but as much as I try, I'm yet to like any one of them. I'm unable to connect or relate with them. They are all kind of forgettable. For one thing, they all seem to me like the same character. Sure, they are diverse in age, look and race, but they're not diverse in personality. Hope. 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 They have similar beliefs, behave identically when facing similar situations, have a fine-tuned sense of right or wrong, and from the movie's perspective, all their actions are for the greater good. I define this type of character as the morally righteous, do-no-wrong rebel. Characters like Rage in Urso, Rose, Leia, Holdo and Anthus Nest easily fall on this description. I have nothing against this particular type of character, but when it begins to show up again and again and again and again, then it starts to get a bit old. And this gets more frustrating when male characters seem to have a bit more variety in motivations, desires and actions. For me, the only interesting and complex character of this new trilogy is Kylo Ren. And just so happens that he's a white straight male. Funny that! It should come as no surprise that the white male writers feel more comfortable writing a white male character. Because he's the only one they don't have to turn into a good role model for children. This is not to say that the male characters in the franchise are better or worse written than the female ones. Because they're not. Really. I'm bringing up the gender of the filmmakers not because I think that makes them less competent at portraying females, but because there's this common phenomenon in fiction where writers, having only one character of the opposite gender in their story or only one minority character, will overcompensate that character with positive traits and barely any negative ones. So female writers will make their token male character the most sensible, pragmatic and reasonable person around while male writers will make their token female character way stronger and powerful than what they probably should. Characters like Rey and Jin are an example of this overcompensation. Since they're the only major female characters in their respective movies, they become the strongest, the smartest, the bravest and the most competent and capable character of the whole cast. Compressor. They can come out of any problem without breaking a sweat. And let me just say that that's not empowering. That's boring. <laughs> Characters are more interesting when they're struggling and having a hard time. If a character is smart and strong, but everything still goes wrong for them despite their efforts, we connect more with them, and it's all more satisfying when they finally win. There's this misconception that almighty powerful and able to defeat any bad guy with a punch equals strong female character. The word strong in strong character has more to do with strong presence and charisma and less with actual physical strength. We like Leia because of her smarts and feisty attitude and not so much because she can handle a blaster. The fact that she knows how to use a weapon gives her that extra pizzazz that fits with her spirit, but Leia has never punched anyone and that never made her less of a strong character. When we are first introduced to Leia, she's begging for help. She is a princess in need of rescue, but she's not a damsel in distress. When things go wrong, she's the first one to come up with a plan, and we understand why she's the leader of a rebellion. Despite being a fantastic character, Leia has gotten a fair share of, um, let's call them, controversial scenes. Aside from Leia, 
The only other major female character has been Padme, who began as a character trying to recapture Leia's spirit but slowly became just a plot device for Anakin's turn to the dark side. Then we have Aunt Peru and Anakin's mother who have no real agency in their story. We have sex slaves and belly dancers, a bunch of minor characters that nobody remembers, and of course, everyone's favorite. Many Bothans died to bring us this information. The Star Wars movies don't have a great track record with female representation, and for this reason, the new films feel the need to constantly remind us that, hey, these new ladies are great and super capable on their own. How many more times do we need a scene where a man comes to a woman's rescue only to realize to his huge surprise that actually she can handle it all by herself, thank you very much. Cool, step three, I re-examine my personal biases. And in case you're wondering, yes, Rey is a Mary Sue, but that's true to plenty of protagonists. Harry Potter is a Mary Sue, James Bond is a Mary Sue, Paul Atreides is a Mary Sue, and it could be argued that Luke Skywalker and Indiana Jones are Mary Sue's to some extent. And no, using a female name like Mary Sue to describe this type of character is not offensive to women. People act like Mary Sue is some kind of insult, but it's not. It's only the term used to identify this trope, much like Swashbuckler Hero or Femme Fatale are used to identify those archetypes. There are plenty of things to be upset about in the entertainment industry, the term Mary Sue ain't one of them. Despite being an overpowered female, I don't completely dislike Rey. At the very least, she shows some personality. Jin Erso, on the other hand, is just a cardboard cutout. Is it that hard to emote, love? Whenever I see Jin Erso or Kensian Endor, I can only think about the Kuleshov effect because they react with the same blank expression for pretty much everything. There's an active effort from the movie's part to balance the number of men and women on screen. But unintentionally or not, the movies end up portraying women in a much better light. Although there's an equal balance when it comes to characters in positions of power, there seems to be the bias that women can only be leaders in the good side, while men in charge are always evil and psychotic. As the last day of the Republic! Most female characters stand by the good guys and their principles are never shaken in any way. Because they're portrayed as incorruptible, there's little room for potential character growth. Audiences want redemption stories, betrayals, conflicting characters. Grey and morally ambiguous characters end up being the most interesting and fun to watch. But if the characters never change, never face difficult decisions and never question their beliefs or choices, they end up being dull because you know exactly what they're going to do and how their story is going to end. And because they're so samey-wamey, the interactions among these women are also very uninteresting. They have no conflicting opinions or contrasting character traits that make them clash or complement one another. If your goal is to create role models for little girls, then you're not doing a good job because you're only presenting one type of female they can look upon. And if your goal is to create engaging characters for your story, then you're also not doing a good job because they're very much the same character type. You've probably noticed by now that not all females in Star Wars fit my morally righteous, do no wrong rebel description. So let's go through the remaining ones and allow me to elaborate why they're still not that great. From what I was able to understand, in the earlier stages of development of The Force Awakens, audiences showed some concern about the possible lack of female characters in the film. So Maskinada and Captain Phasma were written in. Their roles in the films are very insignificant, they have very little screen time and the fact that they're female is practically inconsequential. Maskinada is fine, I guess. She plays mostly as a comic relief and a source for exposition. I don't find her offensive in any way. The character's only sin is that it hides an actress with such great on-screen presence like Lupita Nyong'o behind an uninspiring CG character design. It's not particularly the type of character that little black girls will strive to dress up for Halloween. And then there's Captain Phasma, Star Wars' first on-screen female villain. We all remember the trailer. Chrome Stormtrooper uniform, ghoul cape, played by none other than Sir Brienne of Darth, Gwendolyn Christie in the house, and then we all saw the film.
Boy, was she lame. She doesn't kill anyone, she doesn't fight anyone, she doesn't even use the blaster that she's carrying. Why is she called a villain? <laughs> what villainous thing does she do to grant that title? She scolds Finn. That's it. If she's considered a villain because she's following orders from the bad guys, is this lady a villain too? What about this other one? Or this one? Can any of them be considered the second on-screen female villain? Do you know what the first male villain in Star Wars does? He chokes people two minutes after being introduced. That's how we know he's a villain. But I thought, you know what? At least Phasma's costume doesn't have one of those daft bosom plate armor thing. And that's a positive. And then I found out that the costume was originally designed for a male character. The costume for uh, Captain Phasma was that was actually pitched as a Kylo Ren costume originally. We suddenly realized, oh my god, this is one of the greatest looking costumes I've ever seen. He then she became one of my favorite uh, characters. Progressive? Basically, Captain Phasma only exists because they had a cool costume that they desperately wanted to market as a toy. The fact that she's female was just a happy accident. Wenli Christie just so happened to be nagging to be in the film, and it just so happened that she was tall enough to make the costume look good, so she got the part. Which is a really hard thing to say since Christie is a fantastic actress and is able to pull her own stunts and fight choreographies. And it's even harsher once you find out that she fought really hard to be part of the film and was super thrilled to play a villain. What is it like for you to be able to play the first Star Wars female villain? It's so exciting! They did try to make her a bit more of a menacing villain in the following film, but then they just killed her. Or maybe they didn't because nobody really dies in this franchise anymore. No one's ever really Phasma has a grand total of 3 minutes and 30 seconds of screen time, and that's counting both films. So much for the first female villain. Wanna know what's the second on-screen female villain? That's a rock! And you just made a clicking sound with your mouth! Still way more entertaining villain than Captain Phasma. As I mentioned before, Holdo is a do-no-wrong rebel. I just want to add that I think we didn't need this character in the first place. This conflict should have been between Poe and Leia. It would have been a lot more interesting if that were the case. The audience's problems with Holdo as a character can be summed up with one simple thing. We don't know who she is. As soon as she is introduced, she is thrown in the middle of this major conflict. We don't know her, we don't know her motivations or true intentions, so we mistrust her, just like Poe does. If this were Leia instead, audiences would likely have reacted differently. Given our history with Leia, we are more likely to give her the benefit of the doubt and assume she has strong reasons to keep her plans from Poe. We've always seen Leia as a respected leader so it would have been interesting to see someone challenging her. This would also allow for some mushy things to make more sense plot-wise. For instance, the main reason Leia wouldn't reveal her plans to anyone is that she would know nobody in the Rebellion… resistance would allow her to sacrifice herself. Then, in the end, when Leia is about to pilot the cruiser to save everyone, Poe would figure out her plan and step in her place at the last minute. He would then recognize Leia as a good leader, realizing that she needs to survive to keep the rebellion alive, while still having his one last moment of defiance. Replacing Holdo with Leia would also, you know, give Leia something to do, instead of being unconscious for most of the running time of the film. Great news everyone, we have one more female character in a position of power, but for that to happen, the other one has to be in a coma. There isn't much to talk about Val, unfortunately. Hey, instinct characters with actual fun personalities, oh, they die after 10 minutes of screen time. I like that she was in a relationship, and I like that she wasn't a rebel. 
but her sacrifice felt kind of unnecessary and we didn't get to spend enough time with her for her death to resonate with the audience. I thought the whole point of their deaths was to make Woody Ellison sad, but he seems to get over it fairly quickly, so I don't know. She has a cool costume that black women will probably like to cosplay as. I think I hate L3. I like the concept of L3. A droid that believes in the free will of all droids and wants to free them from humans is a pretty neat idea. But the execution of that idea was... Get your presumptuous ass out of my seat. Because you're my organic overlord. Me, you lumpy brute. That's what I've done. Failure! This character is stonily all over the place. I honestly can't tell if the movie wants us to take her seriously or if she's just a joke. You need anything? Equal rights? <laughs> The human characters don't take her seriously either. Whenever she speaks, they either roll their eyes, smirk or chuckle. And I think we're supposed to see these moments as ha ha, the lightful comic relief. When L3 tells Kira that Lando has a crush on her, the scene plays out as a humorous moment. Yes, yeah, yeah, I see that. It implies that L3 wrongly assumes that Lando loves her. This belief is further emphasized by an earlier scene where Lando says he would wipe L3's memory if it wasn't for her navigation skills. I actually would have a memory wiped. But she's got the best damn navigational database in the galaxy. This line plays off as an earnest statement. I don't think I'm the only person who interprets these scenes this way, and I don't think I'm the only person to become really confused once Lando's devastated by L3's death. L3! What? Her big defying moment of freeing all the enslaved droids happens by accident in another Blade for Laugh sequence. I don't know, free your brothers and sisters or something, just give me some space. <laughs> and after she dies, they decide that the best way to honor the memory of someone who was trying to give free will to enslaved droids is to enslave her and take away all her free will. She's part of the ship now. Does the movie know what message is trying to send? Because I don't think it does. Either we just got a character that is making fun of people who are marginalized and is ridiculing them for wanting equal rights, or we got the darkest and most twisted dystopian tale in recent media. May that be a lesson, kids. Don't ever try to fight for your rights or the people oppressing you will rip your brain off and attach it to a spaceship. She's part of the ship now. As soon as I heard the distorted voice of this masked character, I was like, yep, that's a lady under that mask. I can see the surprise coming a mile away movie. But the film did eventually surprise me, just not in the way it hoped it would. Because I could tell that they were going to reveal that Emphis Nest was female, I got really excited about the character as the movie unfolded. Holy moly, a female pirate in Star Wars! And the leader of the group! Finally, none of this stupid lady rebel business, and holy cow, she's a teenage girl? That's bloody amazing! And then she began to monologue. Finally, the people resisted, shouted back in one voice, no more, to fight back a rebellion. She's another monk! Why do these pirates have to be rebels? Why? Can't there be one female character just acting out of self-interest and not caring about any cause? Just one single female character with no moral code that just steals from others because it's fun to be rich. That's all I'm asking for. A shitty person. Of the new slot of female characters, Kira is probably the most interesting and fleshed out but they still messed it all up. Let's begin with the positives first. I love Kira's look and outfits. Oh my god, cheers. Seriously though, 
Have you noticed how the majority of female characters, in particular the younger ones, have very gender neutral costumes? They're not too masculine, but they're not too feminine either. Some could be worn by men and they look just fine. And that's understandable. Costuming female characters is a very fine line. On the one end of the spectrum, we have Charlize Theron in Mad Max Fury Road. She has a shaved head, her body is dirty and covered in oil, and her clothes hide her female features, unlike the other female counterparts that wear revealing garments. Curiosa's masculinity works in the context of the film. Beautiful women become sex slaves in this universe, so Furiosa has to be one of the boys to survive. But she is, without a doubt, completely stripped of any femininity. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have Charlize Theron in Atomic Blonde. She's a very feminine character, but she fights in high heels and short skirts, and makes a bunch of sexy poses. She's a sexualized character, which is made even more obvious with all the lingering shots of a naked body. With Kira, however, they manage to find a sweet spot. She's an implied sex slave and wears a sexy and somewhat revealing gown, but her body is never sexualized. She changes between looks, wearing both dresses and pants. She has her hair in different styles for different occasions, casual, work, night events. She wears necklaces, rings, earrings, and she even has nail polish. Spacey wacy nail polish! This may sound very superficial, but the way a female character is dressed, or not dressed, is very important for good female representation, and Kira is possibly the most feminine positive female character thus far in Star Wars. The movie seemed to be on the right track with Kira. She's a three-dimensional character who doesn't really fall on a good or a bad side. When we are introduced to Kira, she dreams of being free. You won't have to take orders or be kicked around by anyone. After she fails to escape, a few years pass and it's revealed that Kira is now working for Dryden Boss. As his wife slash sex slave slash employee slash all of the above. It's implied that she has done terrible things, but is still very much motivated by her desire for freedom. We're never entirely sure if she's going to betray Han Solo or not because she has both strong motivations to run away with Han and also strong motivations not to. On the one hand, there's her desire of being free, but on the other, there's her instinct of survival. She might be better off as the right hand of this powerful guy than as a poor smuggler fighting for scraps. Kira has to choose between her feelings for Han or her loyalty to her boss slash lover slash slave master slash all of the above. And just this choice alone makes Kira one of the most complex characters of these new films. So, what went wrong? To understand what exactly didn't work with Kira, I'll have to first explain a very familiar trope. A smart and sexually confident female seduces the hero only to betray him and to be revealed that she's been working for the bad guys all along. This woman often works with the bad guys for other reasons than the main villain's motivation, and seldom agrees with his philosophies. Sometimes she's in this situation against her will, and she's even victim of abuse. That okay? <gasps> However, she rarely has the opportunity to redeem herself, and she often dies in the end. Kira falls on this trope the trope that beautiful, intelligent women are not to be trusted. Now, you may have noticed that Kira fits in this trope, except for one part. She doesn't die. Shortly after Kira was introduced, I thought she was going to die in prequel fashion. But as the movie went along, I thought, wait a second, is the movie about to subvert this trope? We know that she's going to either run away with Han or backstab him, but is she about to do both? Is she going to redeem herself by killing Dryden and also choose to betray Han simultaneously? That would be fantastic! Holy moly, she's really doing this! She's freeing herself! She's announcing to the world that Dryden Voss is dead and she'll seek revenge for those who murdered her beloved husband and that she's now the new leader in Chrism Dawn and... No. No. No, 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 <laughs> no, why? Why? Then we really need this stupid cameo of this stupid spiky-haired alien with this stupid lightsaber. 
Yeah, I know his stupid name is stupid or stupid more. But was it worth it? Was this fan service worth it? I hope it was worth it because it ruined a bloody brilliant character arc. Revealing that she is now under the thumb of some other evil master takes away all her agency in the film, and she is now back exactly to where she began, as someone else's slave. Bring the ship and come to me on Dathomir. She killed a man that was enslaving her only to become the slave of someone else. Leaving Han Solo should have been her choice, not stupid paint faced bricks had choice. She would have still been evil and she would have still betrayed Han, but it would have been her own choice. Her own decision. <sighs> you broke me, Solo. You broke me like no other Star Wars movie ever did. You were this close to become one of the best cases of diverse female representation in modern film. But it all ended slightly skewed on the wrong direction. I think most people understand that limiting females to love interests or damsels in distress is damaging to women's portrayal in media. But giving female characters the ability to wield a sword or punch bad guys doesn't fix the problem if in the end they still don't have their own agency or have the personality of a brick. Female representation is not just about having more women on screen, it's also about representing femininity and diverse womanhood. Femininity has a bad reputation in media. Effeminate men are evil, women who care about their looks are portrayed as vain or inconvenient, and sexually confident women are obviously conniving and dangerous. That's just a fact. Recent portrayals of female heroes seem to imply that strong women don't care about hair or makeup or dresses and only wear pants. There's this implication that a feminine appearance is incompatible with skill or physical strength. But we just have to look at women in sports to understand that femininity doesn't interfere with performance. Some athletes prefer a simpler, bare-faced look, while other athletes like to wear a lot of makeup, elaborate hairstyles and long nails. All of them have their way to express their femininity and that doesn't make them less strong or less capable women. When discussing female characters, I hear this argument a lot. Don't write female characters, write characters that happen to be female. And to that, I say no. The phrase, I'm an ex that just happens to be a woman, applies to women that work in a male dominant field and should not be judged by their gender. But it doesn't apply when you want to represent women in media. The majority of these characters just happen to be female, and that doesn't make them more likable or better written or good female representation. I can feel you looking at me. Men and women are different, and not just biologically different. Society has different expectations for women and men. I'm not here to discuss if those expectations are good or bad. There are positive and negative things on both sides. But for better or worse, we have different gender roles that define the way we behave and live in a community. Some women agree with those roles and gladly follow them, some don't agree and reject them altogether, and others resent them but agree to play the part anyway. And when we have established that there are sexualized women and sex slaves, housewives with no agency and men are surprised for seeing women defend themselves, then we have established that real-life gender roles also apply in this universe and we cannot pretend like they don't exist. That's Admiral Holdo? Not what I expected. There's no one way of being female, so there's no one way of portraying a strong female character. There should be a diverse array of femininity and womanhood in film, from the tomboy to the girly girl to anyone in between. There's also this misconception that strong women are single and have no human or emotional attachments, as if a woman in a relationship could no longer be independent or have a mind of their own. The films don't want Rey to be in a relationship, yet every man she has interact with has become a possible love interest. First there was Finn. Got a boyfriend? Cute boyfriend? Then there was sexy Ren. And by the end of Last Jedi, is the movie implying that Poe can be a potential love interest as well? Yeah, sure, she doesn't kiss anyone, but that doesn't make this any less problematic. It continues to imply that interactions between men and women always have some kind of romantic intentions. Unless he's like gay, then we are certain they can only be friends. 
or if the age gap is too big, then the male characters are no longer potential partners but father figures instead. Because ew, you guys. In my mind, Rey is single not because she doesn't need a man, but she's single because she has to be single. Or do you think she has access to birth control in that desert planet? She can barely provide for herself. She can't afford the risk of getting pregnant. Living in a trashy 8080 is cool when you're a college student, but not when you're a mother of two. I don't mind movies portraying females as single. There are plenty of people that don't strive to find a partner in their lives. But there also needs to be an equal portrayal of healthy relationships. Enough of this will they, won't they business or pointless love triangles or predatory behavior where creepiness is portrayed as romantic. Just a normal couple living adventures together, going through the ups and downs of their relationship where neither of them is a prize to be won at the end and neither of them has to die to make the other one sad. We need more loving couples in Star Wars because so far we only got one real romance out of these films. Poe and BB-8. This brings me to a topic that's not exclusive to women but should be discussed nonetheless. And that topic is about family. For a franchise that claims to be all about family, there are ridiculously little family interactions in it. Most characters don't even have families to begin with. Rey is an orphan, Finn is an orphan, Rose has a sister that dies before we even get to meet Rose, Poe has no family that we know of. No family that we know of, no family, no family, no family, no family, has a family, but nobody likes to talk about that. Those characters that do have families only get to interact with their family members shortly before one of them dies. Having a family is basically a death sentence in this franchise. And I get it. Star Wars is a space opera. They're Shakespearean stories where the family relationships only exist to underline the tragedy of it all. But is it too much to ask for family interactions beyond that? Fans have very divisive opinions about Last Jedi, but pretty much everyone I know likes Leia and Luke's reunion because it is the first time they interact on screen since we found out they're siblings. For the audience, it feels too short. We wanted more of their sibling dynamic beyond the loving farewell. And Leia is a mom. How amazing is that? In a series where the majority of the characters are taken away from their biological family or are raised by uncles, it's quite refreshing to see a major character as an actual mother. This allows room for so much potential growth and interesting character dynamics, but unfortunately, Leia never gets to be a mother. In two movies, we never get a face-to-face -face interaction between her and Kylo. And now that Carrie Fisher passed away, I'm certain I'll never get my dream scene where Leia pulls Kylo Ren's ears for being such a naughty boy and embarrasses him in front of all his First Order friends. I just wanted to see Leia being a real mom. That's never happening now. The best we'll probably get is a CG hug. One of my favorite things in Star Wars parodies is the recurring gag that Darth Vader is super excited to be a dad and wants to teach Luke and play with him and always be around his children. There's something delightful about a big menacing villain who's also a lovable dad. And Star Wars as a series about family is missing that, is missing the everyday life interactions among families. Parents that love to be around their children but get frustrated with them for being disobedient, sons and daughters embarrassed by their parents, the love-hate relationships among siblings. There's a lot to explore with family dynamics, which include plenty of potential new stories when it comes to female representation as well. Stories about motherhood, sisterhood, daughter... Hood? Is that a real word? Okay, that's a real word. Like, what about a single mother who joins the Empire because she believes this is the best way to provide for her and her children? Or two sisters who are smugglers or bounty hunters working together with some sibling rivalry in the mix? Or a couple in a healthy and supportive relationship whose families have a hard time digesting their relationship simply because they're from different alien species. And I'm not talking about a Romeo and Juliet type of thing, just something more like the awkward you're different from the expectations I had for my child type of thing. There's huge uncharted territory to go, but it feels like we're constantly circling around the same stories and dynamics. 
Indiana Jones 5 is currently in development and Steven Spielberg mentioned that he would like to pass the torch to a female lead. That's all fine and good, but I can't help but fear that she's going to be a carbon copy of Indiana Jones. She'll be a scholar and she'll speak a bunch of different languages and she'll be able to ride a horse and hold a gun and punch bad guys in the face and she'll probably have some sort of hat. And that just feels like really condescending to me. It's like being the younger sibling and only be given all the secondhand stuff from the older brother. Used clothes, worn out toys and never getting anything brand new to call our own. To be fair, they might not do a copy-paste female version of Indiana Jones. They might actually come up with a completely original female hero. But, and I know my male audience won't like this, but the fact that they keep hiring white American male writers doesn't appease my mind on this issue. I'm not saying that these are bad writers, because they're not. And I'm not saying that men can't write good female characters either. George R. R. Martin comes to mind as someone capable of writing an incredibly diverse cast, regardless of gender or race. My point being, it's okay for a white man to write stories with female leads or people of color, and it should be largely encouraged. But that writer needs to be aware and fully understand the social nuances and cultural sensibilities of the groups they're representing. That's why it's so important to have people with diverse perspectives on the table, to spot stereotypes and notice tropes that the current writers cannot because they're not female or foreign or non-white. Different perspectives have proven to be great sources of fresh takes and new stories. And audiences are craving for them right now. Finding diverse voices is part of the process of unique storytelling. The issues I've talked about here don't diminish the quality of these films. If you enjoy these movies and you like these characters, that's perfectly fine. I just want to point out that diverse representation in film is still in its infancy. And just like other studios, Lucasfilm is giving its first baby steps and tumbling at each new footstep. But I'm optimistic. Things might get better. There are plenty of positives already. There's an equal balance of men and women on screen with diverse roles, from pilots to engineers to call center operators. There's an effort in evening out the dialogues of minor characters, and background extras are sexy but not sexualized. There's clearly a lot of care and good intentions. So we just have to hope for the best in the future. There's one movie left to go with at least two brand new characters. Maybe they won't fall on these tropes. She spent years pulling that together to potentially fight for what is right. Maybe. Who knows?